And on today's show, Selling the Business to Family Members, part one of this week's series, The Top Business Succession Blueprints, with the architects of Blueprints for Tomorrow, Nate Sachs. Hi everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and contributing author to Backroom Technician and Innsmark. Let's get down to business. Well, welcome to the show, Nate. Good morning, Steve. How are you? Well, I'm doing well, and I'm happy to have you back. I mean, you know, we did a show some months back that people, this brought a huge awareness because everybody thinks they have business succession planning down. It's all about math. It's all about the plans. Is it cross-purchase, buy-sell, stock redemption? But you've taken such a different take on this. Your approach and methodology is so different. But before we get into what your approach is in our first show today, talking about insider selling to our family members, talk a little bit about your past because you have been a monster life insurance producer in your days, especially in the career shop. Talk about that a little bit. Well, I've been in business 35 years. I've done top of the table production, uh, at least top of the table production for the last 20. I have had the privilege of working with 2,000 business owners and uh, I know what I'm doing. 2,000 2, retail consumers. <clears throat> yes, sir. Wow. And then you have, you've also partnered with, I mean, a couple hundred advisors on this as well. Over 500 at any given time. Right now? Currently, less wow. than that, but at any given time, we've had up to 500, yes. So that, that tells me that why are they partnering with you on ideas that we're going to be showing our advisors today? You know, we have really developed a process. We have mm -hmm. developed a, a system, a program that will engage the business owner with the advisor in a very favorable, uh, very favorable manner. When we talk about selling inside, when we're having family member to family member, do you see a lot of American businesses like that? They're closely held family businesses? You know, Steve, 95% of all transitions that do take place, and I say that they do take place, will involve an insider, whether it be a co-owner, management, key employees, and or family. When we talk about this, I like this first graph we have up here. This is a great question, and when I first saw it, and I heard, first heard you talk about this, I thought this is so simple and I got it on the first pass and I think this is why you use it with business owners. Are you the hub in a hub and a spoke wheel? Talk a little bit about that. Most business owners have what I call hub and spoke businesses. The spokes all stay in place because there's a hub. Unfortunately, the owner's the hub. If the owner no longer plays that role of the hub, the spokes no longer work. How do you, tra how do you tra transform your business for, I did need to be the hub for a little while, I had to be the franchise player, but now I need to transition out of that because someday I'm gonna to wanna to sell this business. We've got to get the business owner to begin to transition from the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, we've gotta get him to phase himself or herself out gradually, but really focus on the things they do very, very well and get rid of the rest and begin to grow the company around the people that are gonna stay, not around the current owner. How hard is that transition though? Very hard. Uh, we deal uh, with a lot of the psychological, physical, financial, emotional issues of actually leaving the business. We've got a blueprint mm. called Every Day's a Sunday mm. because they actually have a very, very difficult time walking away from something they've done day in and day out for 30 years with nowhere to go. How do you decentralize yourself when you've been the franchise player in your small business? It's not an easy process. It's, like I said, you gotta look at it from a financial perspective, emotional, physical, and when you're dealing with family, family's a very unique situation. It's hard to look at people that you've diapered Mm -hmm. as responsible adults. Mm -hmm. You're always going to be the father, the uncle, the grandfather, whatever the relationship is, even once you walk through that door of the office. So we got to get everybody kind of treat themselves as strangers, mm -hmm. not as family. Well, when I'm thinking about family relationships and I'm trying to walk through this, there's a, there's a trap that you've identified. It kind of ensnares an owner. It's not intentional, but it just happens. Walk us through that. Most business owners micromanage. Mm -hmm. They've got their hand in every single pot. They control the selling, customer inter interrelations, uh, <clears throat> whatever the company's going to offer, distribution, delivery, the finances. They don't really know how to let go because they've mm -hmm. gotten so many things that they're involved in, they don't know where to start to let go. When I think about young uh, business owners watching this show, do you, how do they keep themselves out of being so integrated into their own business? Part of the entrepreneurial spirit Part of the desire to have this dream and make this dream come true prevents them from doing that. Mm -hmm. it, it, the same ingredients that makes them successful will make them a downfall. Understand something, 80% of all businesses will die a natural death. Mm -hmm. They'll just close their doors. Nine out of 10 transitions never do take place just because of the issues we're talking about this morning. So in all the buy-sells that we've seen, cross-purchase agreements, stock redemption, wait-and-see trusts, even though we talk about it every day, even though we bring it to a business owner, 
the transition and these actual transition success planning never usually takes place. Very rarely. That, that, that startles me. I mean, because we have so, we've spent so much time as an industry and advisors working on this very thing that you're talking about. And I would think that this would be prolific, but you're saying it's really a small minority that actually Very small. It. Business owners are notorious for working in their business. They do not work on their business. How do I make that transition? Let's say I see your, the value of what you're saying, but I've just never done it. Problem is the most people that we work with started out 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago with what I call three P's and a D. They wanted a place to go, position, and a paycheck, and they had a dream. They didn't marry it. They didn't inherit it. They didn't go to Wharton. They're not trust fund babies. They're running businesses, growing businesses without an owner's manual. So if even 20 years later, they haven't really learned how to run it like a business. They're a business owner, but Steve, they have not learned how to run it like a business. They work in it. They do not work on it. We're going to talk more about this when we come back from the break with Nate Sachs. Back in the day, life insurance professionals were called field underwriters. Then, carriers trained their field force in the basics of life insurance underwriting. Today, the insurance industry doesn't educate the agent population as they once did. But now, you can have the informed risk guide at your fingertips so you can illustrate a reasonable rate class for your life insurance prospects. Just request your copy of the informed risk guide at downtobusiness.ashbrokerage.com. It's free from Ash Brokerage, the practice enhancement company. Well, welcome back. We're in our second segment. Nate, I want to talk to you a little bit about, before we get into this checklist, which is monster, tell me the difference between I'm an owner, oh, but I'm also a CEO. I think a lot of people are business owners, but I don't know if they're CEOs. You know, it's funny you say that because every single business owner wears one of two hats. They have the owner or they have the CEO. Very rarely, Steve, will they ever wear both hats and make a decision. I'm constantly trying to get them to decide which hat did you just wear and then what would the counterpart's hat, what would that concern be? If you made that decision as an owner, if you were a paid CEO, what would you be worried about? Mm -hmm. If you made that decision thinking like a CEO, what would the owner of the business be worried about? And do they think differently? Here's an owner versus a CEO? When I explain that to them, mm -hmm. try to get them to do that, yes. Otherwise, they don't realize they're doing it. When, when you bring that and introduce this concept, do they, is this like a revelation to them that they're not acting as, they, they probably think they are the CEO. They're not, though. They're acting mostly as the owner. Mm. I constantly say, what would a paid CEO, someone you paid to run your company, what would their decision be? What would their action steps be? What would they think about what you just committed to? Now, you've ran this over a decade to 2,000 business owners. I this have. is This is a proven system. It's a proven and, program. And it works. Yes. You had to go through this. You had to go through this yourself. There's a lot of trial and error, what works, what doesn't work. Every day, and every day I change it. I meet with probably six to eight business owners every single day, every day. So I'm constantly adding to it or deleting from it. When I realize something works, I add to it. When I realize it's not effective any longer, I delete it. Let's go through your checklist. Okay. Am I committed to succession or not? Obviously you are, right? But you say maybe they're not. Oh, of course not. I mean, they think they are, but when I explain to them the financial, mm -hmm. physical, philosophical, emotional ramifications of walking away, sometimes they say, you know what, maybe I'm not really committed to this. Mm -hmm. When you look at it about your spouse, they want, your spouse wants to be financially secure. You're looking at your business most of the time as your retirement. Well, that's the concern. Can you and your spouse be financially independent? Are all your eggs basically in one basket, the mm -hmm. basket being the business? That's a, and, and when you see that, isn't that the truth in mostly closely held families? That It's all on that. It's, it's all the buildings, the assets, or the hard assets, the inventory. The company. This is the one that really bothers me because even if we had the strategic plan in place, nobody's actually doing it. Well, I always tell them hope is not a strategy. And second of all, if you've got a business mm -hmm. without a very, very detailed strategic plan, you probably only have a hobby. And you offer this in, within the blueprint, is yes, that not so? Yes, we do. Now, when you do this, now you have so many, you have almost 500 advisors partnering with you because they like your coaching and your mentoring through Well, they this. like the program. They love the program. Um, now, of course, now, are you, are you doing your own thing here, too? Because, Nate, you're, you're kind of the central figure of your own business. Oh, my now the, no, my now passion the program is, is actually taking over. No, my passion is working with one-on-one -on -one with business owners mm -hmm. still. So I'm, I'm the beta test. I'm the guinea pig. I'm, I'm the laboratory. If I take it out to our affiliates, it's because we know it works. When you look at a successor, okay. and he has to choose <laughs> within a family, is that tough? Oh, sure it is. It's very tough. And we're constantly saying, be fair. Mm -hmm. Don't necessarily be equal. Mm. Now, what do you mean by that? 
well, if my son's going to take over the business, I've got to give an equal asset to my daughter. Mm -hmm. I've got two girls in the business. I want them both to be 50-50 owners. You just need to be fair. You don't always have to be equal. Equal and, might not be always the right answer. And a lot of the things we use, sometimes we use life insurance to accomplish the equalizing an estate. Well, that's when someone's died. Mm -hmm. we got to deal with the problems when they're still living. Wow. And is that a tough problem to overcome? Very tough. What about this issue, my, have my spouse and I completed our estate planning? How, how, I always thought, no, this is business succession planning. Do they think about this as in segments and estate planning is totally different? It should be thought of together because my concern is, let's say we actually have put together a succession plan. What value is it if the husband and wife mm -hmm. die together, which I had twice happen the month of November? Wow. Two couples in business both died together. First time it's ever happened to me, but it happened twice. And the business all of a sudden is in a forced liquidation situation to pay the estate taxes. When I look at this, it says, do I believe there's life after retirement? I have to meet so many business owners, Nate, they say they'll never retire. <laughs> they're gonna, they say they're gonna die with their boots on. And I understand because their, their obsession, mm -hmm. their passion is this business. They don't know where to go. Do they have it, like you said, I love this line, he says, and have they identified any absorbing new challenge or pursuits? Do they have any interest post work? Really not, they haven't taken the time to pick up golf or tennis or travel with their spouses mm -hmm. or collect stamps or, or, do, or do philanthropic or charitable work. They're there 12 hours a day. And when they're not there, they're emotionally there. I, I, sometimes you have to actually tell them, look at all the options it's for them to pick up they've never considered it. True. What about this question? Am I willing to let others take new business risks? Again, it's looking at that 35-year-old son as a bright young mm -hmm. man versus just someone you diapered. Mm -hmm. I actually had a 96-year-old man, true story, owner of a business tell me over lunch two years ago, his 71-year-old son was not ready to take over yet. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> am, I, am I comfortable with my successor style of leadership? I'm constantly saying judge the children on the outcome, not the mm -hmm. process. Their process might be entirely different than yours. As long as the results are what you'd like mm. to see happen, be satisfied. Well, that's our show for today. Remember, before moving forward with any of the ideas, always consult your tax advisor, legal counsel, or your broker dealer compliance officer. Missed an episode? You can go out to our site, downtobusiness.ashbrokerage.com, and remember, you could be wiser as an Ash Brokerage advisor. I'm Steve Savant for Nate Sachs. We'll see you later.